Hi there. My name is Daniel Sanchez. I'm a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and I'm going to talk to you today about the potential benefits, risks, limitations, costs, and uncertainties of bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration, or BECCS, B-E-C-C-S. The basic idea around biomass is that when, when it grows, it fixes carbon out of the atmosphere. It's storing atmospheric carbon in biomass um, through the process known as the photosynthesis. We're able to harvest that biomass and turn it into products, uh, including energy products, while also capturing and geologically sequestering CO2, um, thus removing it from the atmosphere. Bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration is best thought of as a number of subsystems. Working through from the left to the right of this figure, we can see biomass harvesting of things like energy crops, biomass residues, or other kinds of waste biomass um, at the beginning of the supply chain. That biomass is then harvested and transported to a conversion facility where it was converted either using um, biology um, or chemistry to make um, different energy products. And again, it can be a range of energy products. This can be heat, electricity, um, liquid or gaseous fuels, um, alongside a stream of carbon dioxide that is available for geologic capture, compression, and sequestration. Again, removing that CO2 permanently from the atmosphere and storing it in a geologic formation. As we've begun to learn more about bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration, however, we've realized there's actually an opportunity to store biogenic carbon, carbon that originally came from the atmosphere, in a broader range of products. Um, geologic CO2 sequestration, as shown here at the top of the figure, uh, is often the, uh, the most um, reliable and durable form of carbon storage. But there's also an opportunity to store carbon and biomass in things like engineered wood products, oriented strand board being one of them, biochar, a recalcitrant form of carbon, or bioplastics, including things like bio-derived polyethylene. All of these can contribute to carbon storage on climatically meaningful timescales and thus allow us to use biomass to pull or temporarily store CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, but BEX is a relatively unproven um, technology and one with potentially uh, large side effects at scale. There are several facilities in planning and in pilot stage, but right now there is really only one full-scale demonstration of this technology, uh, and that's at an ethanol plant in Decatur, Illinois, in the United States. There are side effects mainly related to the harvesting and cultivation of biomass and the associated land use change a, a, land use changes associated with that. But we do expect the permanence of geologically cord stored carbon in BEX to be um, relatively stable. And we can best think of several different constraints and factors um, that act throughout the BEX supply chain that can really constrain or drive its deployment. Major categories of constraints include biophysical, things like um, the availability of geologic storage, or land and water, um, institutional constraints, um, including policy and regulation, techno-economic constraints, including markets and supportive policy, uh, and then final social, finally social constraints, including public perception of the technology and political will. So I want to ask, how should we aim to govern bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration, given that there are biophysical, institutional, techno-economic, and social constraints that we need to consider? Ideally, um, BEX is a process that removes CO2 from the atmosphere, stores it reliably underground or in long-lived products, and does no damage to, and ideally promotes, food security, rural livelihoods, biodiversity conservation, and other important values. As I mentioned before, there are many different potential feedstocks that are available for bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. I think that um, when we're trying to do no damage and to ensure verified carbon removal, that waste biomass is preferred. These typically have lower impacts on food and fiber production. Um, and there are waste biomass streams coming from agriculture, forestry, um, industrial, and municipal wastes. Dedicated energy crops, including crops designed specifically as biomass feedstocks, 
may be used in limited amounts, but of course they're constrained by land availability for food and fiber production and all the other competing uses of lands that we need to consider when we're growing biofuels. Managed forests may also provide limited biomass, but of course, uh, sustainable management practices need to be implemented. And then finally, uh, micro and ma macro algae could provide increasing amounts of feedstock um, for bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. As I mentioned before, though, using biomass for carbon capture and storage can create risks. These can include adverse impacts on food security, adverse impacts on rural livelihoods, uh, damages to ecosystems, including biodiversity loss, um, as well as an erosion of the durable CO2 removal benefits from BECs being reduced or eliminated due to indirect land use change and other land use changes that can um, release carbon from the biosphere into the atmosphere. It's important to note that these are not technical issues per se. They are social issues, they are operational issues, and they are policy issues, all of which need to be considered, addressed, and governed. So my colleagues and I provide three guiding principles for um, how we could be implementing BECs to meet our governance goals. The first is to do no harm, very simply. The second one has to do with uh, studying, knowing, predicting, and, and ultimately enhancing the social acceptability of bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. And then finally, we believe that technology development necessarily should reflect social priorities. Um, this is not a one-size-fits-all solution. It's a heterogeneous solution. And we need to understand on-the-ground social priorities for where we're going to be deploying bioenergy with carbon capture. We think that there are feedstocks available for between two and a half to five billion tons of CO2 removal using bioenergy with carbon capture and storage by the year 2050. Um, this is an estimate, again, that some of my colleagues did, looking at uh, estimates of available biomass, understanding how much capturable carbon is available in these different feedstock pathways, and then looking at uh, and trying to understand the amount of land use associated um, with this kind of biomass availability. And again, we think that there is um, robust agreement that there is likely between two and a half and five billion tons of removal opportunity, mainly from waste biomass, that should be available by the year 2050. I want to end by discussing social science and social science research, which is going to be critical for our understanding of how we can govern bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. The most important issue here has to do with the biomass supply chain. We need to understand who controls the biomass, who benefits from the harvest, the use, uh, and the conversion of biomass, and where those benefits are found. Are they local or are they global? And we must clearly uh, recognize that there are both opportunities and risks um, for local communities. And those need to be determined and we need to, to have examined them before we implement BECs at a large scale. Now, finally, I wanna propose that social science research draws from multiple connected disciplines, things like economics, political science, or sociology. Um, it also includes other social sciences like agronomy, nutrition, hydrology, and engineering. Um, and we're really focused on the idea that we can characterize and ultimately increase uh, so-called social demand for bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration or other forms of carbon dioxide removal. This can include synthesis research that looks at lessons learned about carbon sink management or scaling up biofuels, energy transitions, or carbon capture and sequestration. These can be either regional or landscape level analyses of how we could implement carbon removal technologies. These can be analyses of policymaker and citizen demand, as well as consumer knowledge of negative emissions. And then finally, work on technology diffusion um, adoption and transfer of these technologies into different socioeconomic contexts. Much of this great work is done by my colleague uh, Holly Buck at the University of Buffalo. I will stop there and um, appreciate your attention. Hope this gave you a good overview of the various competing priorities, costs and risks of bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. And I look forward to further questions and discussion. Thank you.